Okay. So, we're kind of getting, of course, through the how and the why of this whole devolution series and, and showing you slides of stuff. And, and like I said, we are really coming to probably closer to the end. I could go on. I told uh, Lena the other day that in each topic that I'm talking about, I probably can do four sessions on each one, but it's so much information that it's it's almost like you know I don't need to do four weeks worth of gap theory and why it falls apart. I've done that pretty well in, in a week or two. So so we could, and if it's something you're interested in, I'll make sure to get you all. I can get you every slide, all the materials. Um, I am working on it on putting in into a curriculum form uh, because uh, what is a kid's worldview going to be after 12 years in the public school system. Not only that, there's. I was reading a report. That's one of the things that caught me. It popped up on my phone. I was looking for it earlier. That that even even there are, there are Christian homeschool parents that are asking because the curriculum. I guess the curriculum. There's no shortage of creation curriculum, right? In home, but but there's parents asking for curriculum, Christian curriculum with evolution in it now. Now they're not a big majority of people. It's a very it's a small minority of of, of people doing it. But it's if it creeps in, it creeps in. So uh, it, it's the worldview thing. It, it's what people, you know, you, I don't think I have it on today's slide, but Adolf Hitler, I, I said, you know, let's start church and quote Adolf Hitler. Uh, but, but, you know, his, one of his big things, if you tell a lie often enough, loud enough, people will believe it. You'll even start to believe it yourself. Uh, he also said that people are more apt to believe a big lie than a small lie. I, I, have, I hate to say it, but he was right. Uh, he's a boy. He's a great example. Um, you know, is it possible for a group of people to buy into a lie? Intelligent people. Well, let's just look at Jonestown. Jim Jones. I was getting there. Yeah, <laughs> Jim Jones, apparently a very charismatic preacher, and multiple people died through that. Uh, so, is it possible for a group of intelligent people, or people, learned people, to to buy into a lie? Yeah, obviously. Is it possible for an entire nation to lose their mind and buy into a lie? Yeah, look at Nazi Germany. Uh, look at look at Stalinist Russia. They're, they're, yes, yes, there is. It is possible. We'll buy into it. So what I kind of want to talk about is the difference in the earth uh, pre-flood, post-flood, and point to some, some facts on that today. I have talked about the vapor canopy, and I've been very, very quick about it, so we're going to hit that and a couple other things. But but just, just to kind of start with our slide, this is, I've, y'all have seen this slide come up a couple times. Uh, this is the ages, and it's hard to see, but the blue bars are the ages of the men. In the, towards the right-hand side of the screen, there's a red line, red and white line going down. That is the flood. So we got Adam, Seth, goes all the way down to Methuselah, and on and on to, to Noah, who's covered up right now, but... Their age is around 900 years old pre-flood. Then you get to the flood, and they rapidly start to decrease. So something happened, climate, something had to happen. I know God says I'm not going to deal with men much longer. He could only handle us for about 120 years. I agree. I don't want to live past that. I don't think, I just don't. Take me home. Uh, next, Lena. So this is, this is the top section of that. That's just from Adam to Noah. The average age before the flood was 912 years. Today it is 70 to 80 years old. 912 years. So something had to be different. Can, if, if we did stati- numbers-wise, okay, if we lived to be 912 years old, we would start having kids. Okay, well, how do I say this? Let me think. If you compare the, nine, the Noah's day and Adam's day, and when they had kids in their 900-year lifespan, it is equivalent to us having kids at five and a half years old. I mean, that would, that would stink, wouldn't it? It's like, who's, the, who, who's changing who here? Who's, uh, but it's the same equivalent. If you would have had a kid at five and a half years old, that's about how much life they had lived of their percentage of their lifespan when they started having kids. Um, next, we talk about the vapor canopy. Okay, and I'm going to kind of point to this a little bit. Where did all this water come from that, enti- that flooded the entire earth? We've talked about that. Where did it all go? Were there really giant people over 10 foot tall? Because the Bible talks about Nephilim and giants. Genesis 6, 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. 
going to kind of hit that. 2 Peter 3.3 3 says, most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last day, scoffers, mockers of, uh, scoffers, mockers of the truth will show up following their own desires. 3.5 goes on to say, they deliberately forget that God made the heavens, yes, by the word of his command and brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water, brought it out from the water, surrounded it with water. They deliberately forget is Greek for their being dumb on purpose or willfully ignorant. 3.6 says this, then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. To destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. There's got to be a, a transformation that comes. 3.7 says, and by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. Now, um, here, here's the thing with that, the present heavens and earth. We know that heaven was created, we know the creation of heaven. If you look all the way at the beginning of Genesis, the translations today and the ones I have read say, God created the heavens and the earth. But if you go to the original, go to the 1900 King James Version, it'll, or the 16, excuse me, 1611 King James Version says, the heaven created heaven and the earth. Go all the way back to the Hebrew, it's a, it's a singular thing until he starts talking about the spaces in between the atmosphere and above. Then it goes to heavens. So when he talks about the heavens being destroyed here, he is talking about something in our atmosphere somewhat when you go to the translation next. Power in the hands of a crazy man is dangerous. Just like ignorance of God's word is dangerous, but wisdom, wisdom being used as a weapon, that's deadly. The book of First Pastor 3.3. 3. Wisdom being used as a weapon is deadly. Power in the hands of a crazy man is dangerous. Ignorance of God's word is dangerous. Let me, let me give you an example of this. One example of this is bumper sticker. Drives me nuts. Jesus is coming, and boys, he mad. I just about could guarantee you not a single soul has been won from that bumper sticker. Boys, he might know if he's anything, he's probably sad. But at the same time, he's glorious and on fire and, and, and excited and doing what he does. Uh, so wisdom in the hands, wisdom being used as a weapon is dangerous. We see that when we use the Bible as a weapon, it's dangerous. Any kind of wisdom, scientific wisdom used as a weapon is dangerous. But then the next one, we go to the Ignorance of, the God, of God's word lets us take what we think is wisdom <laughs> and spread it and propagate it when we don't really understand it. Ignorance uh, has caused people to compromise the Bible with new teachings like the gap theory, the day-age theory, and there's no reason for me to go over those because I have smashed those two or three times. Even at a point, I would love to dig them up, like I said, and, and debate them, um, not for the sake of debate, just so they could maybe go to heaven. Um, anyway... No, that's horrible. I don't mean that. Uh, so I explained those problems already. You can skip, go past that slide. Uh, so we're going to get to the firmament, the vapor. Genesis 1, 6, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. Look how smooth that is. Next slide. If you look at continents and land, land is usually dividing the water. So people like to say that, that since dirt keeps oceans away from each other, that, should, that could be the firmament. Um, that doesn't hold salt. That doesn't really work out with Scripture, because we'll go on to the next Scripture here, Genesis 120. God said that the waters bring forth abundantly moving creatures, foul birds, that they may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. That's not dirt. They don't fly in dirt. I've never seen a bird fly in dirt. If there is one, please let me know. Probably a sand lizard, but that's still not flying. Uh, <laughs> all right, Genesis uh, 1, 14 and 16 says, um, And let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night. He made, he made the stars also in the great lights. So Psalms talks about this, 19. And the heavens declare the glory. The firmament shows his handiwork. The heavens declare his glory. What does the Bible say about creation? Creation declares, it praises him. Creation cries out and worship him, that even the rocks themselves will cry out and groan. All creation is worshiping God in some way or another. Psalm 148.4 says, praise him. Heavens of heavens, the waters that be above the heavens. 
NLT says the skies above, right? Praise him in the skies above. It says praise him in the vapors high above the clouds. Vapors high above the clouds. This is written by King David around 1000 BC. Currently, our earth has six layers of atmosphere. Six layers of atmosphere, and I remember in the 80s, a big hole we were scared of. So no one could use, what was that hair? Net hairspray. Anybody old enough to remember net hairspray? Aquanet or net hair? Big 19-gallon aerosol bottle. Really good for killing spiders at a distance with a, with a, with a lighter. Um, anyway, six layers of atmosphere. There used to be seven is what I'm trying to get to biblically. There used to be seven, a seventh layer of atmosphere, a layer of water ice above the atmosphere. Now, this is the firmament we talk about. I can back this up. We're going to back this up with historical writings, Josephus' writings, and things like that. We're also going to explain what that layer would have done and why it makes sense. Now, if we had, next slide, if we had a uh, layer, let's say, of, of this, this crystalline ice, vapor ice around our atmosphere, it would block X-rays and UV radiation from hitting us the way it does now. A lot of people think ice is expended by this thing called the Meisner effect. If you've ever seen, the, uh, they'll, they'll, put a, they'll super freeze the top of a, of a conductor or a superconductor and put a magnet on top of it and it floats. It's kind of the same idea they use for the trains over in, in Japan that go so fast on the magnetic rail. Now, uh, this is a, the next is a, this is a, um, a magazine talking about ice clouds that form from shuttles when they take off into space. The shuttle exhaust causes, causes these ice clouds, and no matter where they go, take off from, the ice clouds always drift up towards the poles, and they float there, 220 degrees, negative 220 degrees Fahrenheit, 51 miles above the Arctic. So we've seen it happen. Now we get to Josephus, the historian, the Jewish historian, who writes, he set the heaven above the universe, surrounding it with ice. And before I move forward, I want to look, I just want to, I didn't make a slide on this, but I want to look at the word universe for a second. We break it apart. You have two words, two root words there, one of them being verse. Does anyone know what a verse is? Like a scripture verse, I guess. Una, una means one. Verse means spoken sentence. The universe is one spoken sentence for God created in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I think it's beautiful when you think about that, that what the word we use to describe creation, the universe, broke down means one spoken sentence, and in one spoken sentence it happened. Uh, anyway, that's just a golden nugget for free. That's not even a slide today. So here's another part of Josephus' translation. It says, he also placed a crystalline firmament around it, talking about the earth. Next one, Josephus says, the thickness of this firmament being about three fingers. So it wasn't thick. We're talking about a very thin crystalline layer around the atmosphere, but that's a, that's a lot of ice. Just because it's only about three inches thick doesn't mean it's much. We're talking about surrounding the globe, surrounding our atmosphere and beyond. So next, canopy of water. Dr. Carl Bow did a lot of study, a lot of research on this. He said the canopy of water overhead, we would also have the Water under the crust of the earth, that's the fountain of the deep, deep that burst forth. Next one kind of shows just a few inches of ice above the atmosphere, 15 to 20 miles or so. 10 to 20 miles below the crust, or you have 10 to 20 miles of crust, and then a half a mile or so of water under the crust. These are the fountains of the deep. Original creation of the earth was vastly, drastically different than what we see today. It had to be. We can't live, if you lived to be 900 years old today, you'd be one big wrinkle. <laughs> Your belly button would be on the floor. <laughs> There's no way. I mean, it just, just with, and, and just simply UV radiation and things like that, there's no way we would make it through. It would tear us apart, yes. So something was protecting us. Now, I've talked a lot about the hydro expansion theory. Well, really quick, this is a, a breakdown of, that, let's say that's a pre-flood sea on top. Then you have the granite, kind of the crust of the earth, and then these um, subterranean water chambers separated a little bit by a pillar. Now, <laughs> hydro expansion theory says that cracks appeared quickly. Okay, Waters of the deep burst forth, as the Bible says. Those superheated 
uh, superheated water melted the canopy, along with making the, the continents, the, the land, slide apart quickly. Now, next slide says, 600 year Genesis 7, 11, 12, the 600th year of Noah, the same day, all the fountains of the great deep broke up, the windows of heaven were opened. Fountains of the deep broke up. It had never rained before, remember that. If it melts this canopy and it starts to fall, now the windows of heaven have been opened up. And the rain was upon the earth like East Texas in what we call winter. Next slide. Pre-flood, you'd see the, the, the crust. It would have a rupture area. Now, let me explain. This is the computer simulations of this. The idea is if this happened, there would be a crack that appeared in the crust of the earth. It would have burst, rock, the, the rocks would have burst up out. But other than just the seam or the crack that it burst out of, because of the pressure of the water, it would also created scars or like stitching down the seam. So a long seam was stitching across it, let's say. Next picture is kind of an idea of that. Just an idea of what it, the sea would have caused the water to go up, water to flood out, and it would have caused grooves. Now, remember that because I'll get to it in a minute. Now, Mathematically, computer simulations, a cubic foot of rock weighs about 160 pounds. So 10 miles of rock, the crust of the earth would have been over 8 million pounds of pressure per square inch. Uh, about 30 tons per square inch, actually. They've done this. They've done the models. They've figured it out. They've, they've done computer simulations. Once that crack developed, the pressure, the PSI would have been so fierce it could have, when the water started to squirt up, it would have been able to lock rock, launch rocks into space. Let me let me explain something here. It is. I mean, I'm saying it is. Here's the thing. The reason I'm saying that there's so many times meteors hit Earth and they just don't understand why the composition is so much like the Earth. Now, there's times they're not, but more times than, than not, material just like what we find on the Earth. Maybe it's from here, okay? Uh, a lot of times they say it has to do with the whatever planet they think collided with us and created the moon, and that's where we get these meteors from. But, next slide. What if the debris in space that we hit from meteors is stuff that's already come from Earth? That's why the composition is always the same. Mathematically, it makes sense. It would have, it would have launched them into space. Tons and tons and tons of rock. Next slide. So during the flood, what would have happened is this crack would have appeared. Water would have burst up and out. Now, as the, as the subterranean chambers start to empty, we have the ground, the crust would fall and slide, okay? But where the crack appeared, that's where the most pressure and the most weight would be released, you'd have a, a little ridge pop up, like, a, like the mid-Atlantic ridge, let's say. An illustration of this is, is this picture of this spring. Hello, spring. Thank you. If I, put a spring, if I put a spring on top of a rock and I compressed it with my fingers and you put two blocks on top of it, it's going to stay compressed, it's going to stay flat. But as you start moving those blocks off the top of it, little by little, pressure by pressure, the spring's going to buckle in the center. It's the same idea as what they say the, the mantle of the earth would have done had the hydro expansion theory, the fountains of the deep burst forth. Had the, if the Bible was actually true, okay, this is what they say would have happened. It would have burst up and it would have made this big ridge. Next slide. In the beginning, it would have caused, plate, caused plates all of a sudden to start shifting. It would have caused the crust to shift into different areas. You would have not wanted to be on the earth when this was going on. Anybody that says that, I really wish I was around to see the flood. No, unless your name's Noah. No, you don't. He didn't even see it. He was locked in a boat. It was horrid. Things happened during creation and during the flood that have never happened again. And it wasn't simple. If you can imagine mountains popping up out of nowhere and, and, and land sliding apart. And this is a picture next of what's called the folded mountains. And you can see the, the, the way the mountains are kind of the, the grooves of the folds. Now, they say that some great vertical force caused these mountains to, be, to develop like that. But if you really look at it... Um, Go to the next one. It looks more like a like horizontal, a lateral compression. Next slide, babe. Lateral compression is the best thing that can play, that, that will explain why these mountains look like this. Lateral compression makes sense. 
So if this was true, it would leave this humongous scar upon the earth with stitching that almost looked like a baseball. Next slide. Mid-Atlantic Ridge. One of them. That's one of many. You have the San Andreas Fault. You have other ones. But computer simulations show that it would have bust, burst up in the center and caused all these grooves out the side. There's still a lot of... Um, give me the next one is San Andreas Fault, the one that's eventually going to take California out of the United States, maybe. But uh, <laughs> there's, there's still a lot of debate as to what caused tectonic plate movement. They still debate this. They still don't understand it. They're still, if Pangaea was a supercontinent, how did it start moving all of a sudden? There's still tons of debate on it. Next slide is just, there's still water under the crust of the earth, some. There's subterranean chambers of water that we found. We know that there's some, we found a third of the way to the core of the earth, we found water. Um, we know that there's water down there, or next slide, there would not be uh, hot water vents on the ocean floor. Wouldn't be any, any of the vents. So now from there, just explaining why the canopy, where the canopy went, why there's not an ice canopy now, the greenhouse effect would have next would have um, protected us from all those rays, all the radiation, all the all, all the things that would, would that really take us out today. Um, next slide. This is a 1998 European scientist had launched this. Um, ultra-cold orbiting telescope into space, and they discovered volumes, unimaginable volumes of water in space between the stars and around the planets. And it said that they were astounded to find water vapor in the freezing atmospheres of Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, and Titan. Water vapor in these freezing atmospheres around them. Now, before I go to the next one, Carl Bow, that's the guy that has done a lot of study on this, recent study on this doctor. He is a doctor. He's got a Doctorate of some sort. He's, I don't know, a doctorate of book writing. Who knows? All creation cries out to God, does it not? So in his simulations, in his studies, what's the water vapor do? What would this ice do? Give me the next slide. He thinks that the canopy of ice would have changed the star's radio waves that we hear into audible sounds. By that, I mean when you turn your radio on, it's on a bad station, no station, you hear this background radiation radio waves what you're hearing when they use a radio telescope to listen to stuff. Through experiments that he has, he has done through ice and different, he really believes that it would have caused the stars to make an audible sound to human ears. Job 38, 7, when the morning stars sang together, all the sons of God shouted for joy. All of creation was made to glorify God. Understand that. All of creation was made beautifully, perfectly to act together. When I say that the world is nothing like it was before the flood, there's no telling. Remember, Adam named all these animals in a day. He had a, an extensive vocabulary. Eve was not startled when the serpent spoke to her. Something else had, I mean, they must have been talking before or something. They good old friends, I don't know. There's so many things we don't know we'll never know, but I can tell you it was drastically, drastically different. Next slide. Oh, had to have a tremendous man. Had to have an amazing mind, man. So these is, this is a report. I had tons of these. I didn't want to use them all, but saying that 50% more oxygen that the, the Earth had, 50% more oxygen than it does now. Um, some say 35%, but that, that back during the days of the dinosaurs, that, that the oxygen, there's much more oxygen on the planet. Now, does anybody know what a hyperbaric chamber is? Okay. Hyperbaric chambers. This is a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. I've been a scuba diver. This is the thing you don't want to get into. It means you have the bends. It means you came up too fast. Nitrogen bubbles popped into your body, and then you are sick, and it's not, it does not feel good. Hyperbaric chamber, oxygen chambers, just they, they, they multiply the amount of oxygen around you, compress it. Now, West Germany, every stroke patient in West Germany is sent for three weeks of intensive hyperbaric oxygen treatments paid for by their insurance companies. Imagine that. They actually pay for them. Anyway, England, next. England has over 6,000 multiple sclerosis patients being treated with these chambers. France results uh, in treatments of arthritis and, and, and other things. Uh, then you have, I have more Japan, next. 200 chambers, promising work in the treatment of sudden deafness, blindness, 
uh, diabetic treatments uh, in Sweden, Belgium, uh, re-implants of total extremities, India, leprosy. My favorite one, nope, I, I left it out. I'll get, keep it there, but there's, there's one that's doing studies with hyperbaric chambers on autism and other neurological disorders, and the results have been amazing. Yes? The med bed? Possibly, is it individual, like like something you can, I probably, if it's a little, I had a picture of something new they were selling, which is probably it, the med bed, it's just, if it's a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, that's what it is. They use them, sports teams use them. Like, there's there's a handful of NFL teams that use them, uh, Major League Baseball, any guy that hurt that's hurt, they put in there. Of course, the Cowboys are one, because they have entirely too much money. Um, but uh, who told me the other day, that is a non-profit corporation. NFL. Anyway, anyway, not that's not what I'm here for. Uh, this is a professor, or was a professor, he's passed away now, in Tokyo, who raised tomato plants under a plastic greenhouse that filtered out UV light. But he also pressurized, he also sent them extra CO2 through the stems from uh, pressurized CO2. Now, <laughs> blocked out the UV light, here's the next one. He had a 16 foot tall, one of the plants was 16 foot tall, produced 907 tomatoes. You can still buy this stuff today over in Tokyo, growing from this plant. I couldn't keep a tomato plant through a whole season. Anyway, in 1985, they had an expo attraction plant that may bear 10,000 tomatoes. It grows under lenses that filter out harmful rays, sun's harmful rays, UV light. So the whole point of this, the next slide, this supports the idea that pre-flood conditions were drastically different, while it also points to the truth of God's word which is why a secular science community refuses to even discuss it, because it points to the truth of God's Word. Next one, they wouldn't hide information or neglect facts, would they, just because it makes sense? Or it proves something contrary to their deeply atheistic beliefs, would they? No, not at all, right? Next slide. This is the National Center for Science Education. The president this is on their page. Welcome to the homepage of the National Center for Science and Education. Nonprofit tax exempt membership, da 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 da. Working to defend the teaching of evolution against uh, sectarian attacks. That's a sect, a belief, a group, or something. We're nationally a nationally recognized clearinghouse for information and advice to keep evolution in science classrooms and scientific creationism out. Scientific create. They are the National Center for Science Education, but they don't want to talk about science creationism. So where did this National Center come from? Next slide. Oh, Andrew. Andrew Carney. Oh, Mr. Carnegie. Remember I, I gave you a quote of how thankful he was to hear the theory of evolution in college and got him away from his theological beliefs from, from growing up? Their purpose to keep creation out of public schools. Even if it makes sense, even if, if we were able to prove it today, they wouldn't hide it from us, would they? Well, apparently they will. And they use the arguments like coal deposits that take millions of years to form. One of my favorite arguments, coal deposits takes millions of years to form. Um, give me that picture of the bell. Mr. Newton Anderson found this bell inside of a lump of coal in 1944, West Virginia. That is his email address. If you'd like to ask his family about it, that is his phone number about it too. They still own it. Next, cast iron pot, 1912, found inside of a lump of coal. That wasn't made all of a sudden. Somebody made the, that. That's, that's made by humans, I'm just saying. And if we're not here for millions of years, my, this is my fun one. This was in Iraq. 1922, it's a, it's a sole of a shoe. Imprint, it held it, it's inside the rock so well, the stitching pattern was clearly visible. The twist of the thread could be seen, but the rock was 213 to 248 million years old. I'm not really sure. No, but that's the kind of math I did in school and got in trouble for. Um, yeah, so, so I, I identify as someone who has no debt, therefore I am not paying you, sir. <laughs> One day it's going to work. It hadn't yet. Anyway... 
the earth today, 70% of the earth is, oh, what is that? There we go. 70% of the earth is underwater. Then the rest of it, a lot of the rest of it, like desert, ice caps, tundra, treeless mountain ranges, there's only 3% of the earth that is habitable for man. You cannot tell me that the earth is not drastically different from the flood. Isaiah 50, or 45, 18, he made the world to be lived in and not a place of empty chaos. He made it to be inhabited. He formed the earth for us to live on. So now we have to say that there's a ton of land missing. Post-flood, land falls into the chambers of the deep. It's covered up. So some questions. This is some possibilities here. Pre-flood world probably had increased air pressure. 20 to 100%, who knows? Way more CO2. We have 0.06% now. They probably had at least 2%. It filtered sunlight, less UV and X, uh, rays and X-rays. The soil was perfect, uh, but was destroyed by the flood. There was, could have been music that came from the stars. We probably had 90% land mass instead of the 30% we have now. And the watering system was amazing. It watered from the roots up instead of the other way around. Genesis 2.6. Remember, they had no rain, water, the dew, the mountain dew, the water dew, mountain dew, the water dew. <laughs> the mountain dew would carbonate them for days, um, caffeinate them. There was no coffee. They did the dew. But the dew, dew would appear, dew would seep up from the ground and appear on, on the grass. It was, yeah, the misters from underneath, basically. Yeah, that's a good career. That's a good, good idea. Yeah. Pre-flood world was loaded. I'm sure with bigger trees, bigger animals from pole to pole. We see that a lot. And then we go back to the UV. The water layer would block out all those rays that hurt us today, keep the things from growing. So, and one of the questions is, and some of these are questions people have sent me next. The Bible claims that giants roam the earth. This was true. Wouldn't we at least have some remains of a race of giants? You are absolutely true, sir. <clears throat> You're right. I'm sorry that I can't prove this. Next. Robert. Robert was 8 foot 11 inches in 1940 before he died. Lived in Illinois. I understand pituitary gland disorder and all that stuff. I get that. But, but that's, a, that's a giant of a man. Um, next, we see a picture of his size 37 shoe next to a size 11. Can you imagine being stepped on? Anyway. Next, 1 Samuel 17, 4 says that there was a champion out of the camp of Philistine named Goliath of Gath who was, height was six cubits in a span. This came from the Ark Museum uh, from uh, Creation Sciences, Science Institute. Um, this is actually a cubit measuring rod. This is what Noah would have used to measure. On the, that's a lot of measuring, though. He didn't have a fat mass. He couldn't throw the tape out there. Um, and there's, there's different markings on it because you have uh, the Egyptian cubit and the Hebrew cubit and all these different measurements. Basically, it's from the tip of your finger to, to, to here or so. Now, measuring myself, I am maybe I'm around four cubits. If he was six cubits in a span, and we're saying, let's say the cubit's 21 inches, he was almost four foot taller than I am. He was anywhere from three to four. I'm six foot four, so Goliath had to be anywhere from nine foot plus to... 10 foot plus. A lot of people say 9. 9 to 11 if you really span it out right. Now, this is uh, Robert next to him again, uh, who was 8, 11. That's, that's not really Goliath. That's a drawn picture. Okay. Uh, okay. Before anybody emails and says, that wasn't a real picture of Goliath. I know. I, I am fully aware, sir. There's a statue of him. He weighed 490 pounds, as lanky as he was, 490 pounds. Now, this is modern. Um, next, this is a drawing. Okay? An Italian coal mine, coal mine, they found this skeleton, this man that was 11 foot 6 inches. Next slide. They were truly trying to determine whether it was male or female, and they didn't know how to do it with the skeleton. How do you determine if it's male or female from the skeleton? Next slide. It's not from the rib. It's the only number, okay, it's not the number of ribs, male, female, because the only, only bone that can grow back in your body is your lower rib. The way that they were able to tell the male from the female, if her feet were pointed towards target, they knew it was female. <laughs> if it was, I don't know. Uh, 
No, here's, here's, the, here's the one. This is uh, on the female, the, the TMJ of the woman is wore out because she has to tell the man everything twice because he doesn't listen. All right. All right, I'm done. I'm done. Okay, I'm back to the next. All right. This was the world's tallest man before he passed away. He lived in the Ukraine. Next one. He was eight foot seven inches tall. Here's a picture of him next to his family at eight foot four. Next is a picture of his hand next to his father's hand. This is him trying to dial a number on his cell phone. You mad because you're short? Can you imagine having to deal with all that? Ceiling fans? Oh, my gosh. Anyway. Okay, so that's modern stuff. We could say it's pituitary gland disorder or tumors or what. Not. But how about Roman emperors? Roman Emperor Maximus, he was 8 foot 6 inches tall on record. 8 foot 6 inches tall. They said that he was a, a, a beast of a man that he could carry two, he could pull two carts that were fully loaded by himself unaided. I got a bunch of that. I'm about to hit you with a bunch of, of skeletal remains. So just be prepared. Next, I'm going to go quickly. Skeleton, nine feet, eight inches tall, was recovered from a stone burial mound in Indiana in 1879. It was in their newspaper. It was ran again in 1975. And we have this in the early 70s. Uh, this man, Charles, that's his phone number, he lives in California, in case you need to call him too to check my stuff. He was vacationing in Virginia City uh, when he went to a small private museum, and he saw two skeletons in this, in this pit covered with glass. They were around nine feet tall. Ten years later, he went back to that same museum, and they were gone. He asked the owner where they went. He said, a man from the government came and got them. We will not give them back. They don't want truth. Anything that proves anything of the Bible, their fear if you don't believe that there's evil running this country that's against us, uh, you've got to open your eyes to a point that they will hide natural history. There is a history of the human race that is being hidden from us. Next is, uh, this was buried beneath heavy layers of shale. This is in my home, Shreveport, Louisiana. Wait, did I skip one lane? Nope. Nope, you did. Shreveport, Louisiana. Mr. J.M. Clay found unmistakable evidence of a prehistoric race. Huge bones, similar in every respect to a man's, were found embedded in thick layers of these clam shells. As many as a score, which is 20 skeletons, were found intact, each one around nine feet tall. That was run in 1902 in the newspaper. It was rerun in uh, uh, 2002 in the Cushata Citizen. Uh, in is about the size of, uh, well, nothing, but it's, it's a little bitty, little bitty town. Uh, next, we have a skeleton nearly uh, 10 feet long. It's found in uh, Humboldt Lake, June 1931. Then you have these legends in Guam of these stones. That is not the latte stones. I'm sorry, it's the Latte. It's actually the Latte stones. Uh, they say that their ancestors built them. They're, they're humongous, and they're still there today. I have a picture next that shows their size. That There's actually a man on the... Right-hand side of the screen, standing by one of them. They say these giant ancestors built them, and I understand the stories. I get that, but here's one. 20 miles southwest, uh, uh, southwest South Bend, Indiana, a group of amateur archaeologists opened a mound. If you haven't noticed, around America, especially the plain, well, anywhere from New England, over there are these huge mounds, weird mounds. There's designed mounds. Uh, they opened up this mound in 1925, and Unearthed skeletons, eight giants ranging from nine feet, or around eight to nine feet long, all wearing heavy copy, copper armor. Close. 1616 Dutch explorers described stumbling upon a pair of skeletons more than nine feet tall. Now, I, my father's side is Native American. There are a lot of stories they tell, but there are things that they hold on to deeply. There are stories that are told for, for life uh, lessons. Uh, I had uncles at the family reunions that would that would talk to us about it, and there are things that they will they they will die on being true. One of those things is around the entirety of the United States, what we call the Native American people, uh, 
basically spent decades in wars with a very, very giant race in different areas. The Iroquois were almost wiped out by this race. Uh, uh, it's not one single race. It's a different races throughout. So give me the next one. Magellan. Mr. Magellan used the word Patagonia to that same area where those Dutch explorers were. He used the word Patagonia in 1520 to describe the people of that area. He told in his books of this giant race that he encountered, it means big feet. So the, the, the big feet people is what he called them. There really was a big foot. Huh? Okay. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, depending on his size as a man, it, it could be huge. So what we think a 300 cubic foot boat could be, it could really be six. There's no telling. Uh, we have a, a skeleton in California, 12 feet tall, was found by soldiers. The remains were buried 12 feet tall. The remains were buried very quickly due to the local Indians, the things they had to say about it. Boom. Uh, another 12 foot tall skeleton reported in many papers in 1891 in Arizona. Man had six toes, long hair, bird shaped headdress. You read the Bible, is there anything y'all know about the giants in the Bible they talk about, what they had, the, the extremities, their hands, feet, six fingers, six toes, and what about teeth? Two rows of teeth, two rows of teeth. One place talks about the two rows of teeth that they had, biblically. Um, I say that for this, well, not this, but this is in Scientific America. It's called the Nevada Giant is what they're talking about. They wrote in there from knee to heel, they measured 39 inches. From knee to heel, 39 inches. Their owner had to stand over 12 feet tall, these bones that they had found. Scientific American, again, later on, no, not Scientific American, excuse me. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. The Ohio Giants. This is in 1999 when this was published. Talking about giants that were found, uh, respectively, 9 feet, 4 inches, and 8 feet. Several other skeletons were found in the mound, the two other male and female, nine foot four, eight foot, others ten feet. Same report goes on to say, next, that they found a woman as well, seven feet tall with an infant. Next. And they found a skull almost twice the size of a normal skull. All in 1999. Next. There's a guy named Bernard Diaz de Castillo. Tillo, Tio, Castillo, excuse me. Spanish conquistador, author, historian. He was one of the soldiers under, con under Cortez during his conquest of Mexico. Basically him <laughs> coming and wrecking the place, okay? But he wrote down things that were happening, things that he saw, things that he experienced, and we use it, it it's been used as, as, as part of his history books. He said this, our friends told us how and where they came into this land and country and how they had settled themselves there how it came, notwithstanding their vicinity to the Mexicans or the Aztecs. They resembled each other so little and lived in perpetual warfare with each other. What's he talking about? Next. The tradition was also handed down from their forefathers that in ancient times there lived here a race of men and women who were of immense stature with heavy bones, very bad and evil disposed people. They had uh, the greater part exterminated by continual war. The few that were left gradually died out. Next, he says this. In order to give us a notion of the huge frame of this pe these people, they dragged a bone, a thigh bone, of one of these giants out. Very strong. It measured the length of a man's good stature. This bone was still entire from knee to hip joint. I measured it by my own person and found it to be of my own length. Now, probably wasn't the tallest guy, but still, the shortest guy. That's a big thigh bone. Next, he says, uh, although I, oh, he wasn't, I bet I, Apparently, he was of considerable height. I forgot about that. They showed us many similar pieces of bones, but they were all worm-eaten and decayed. We, however, did not doubt for an instant that this country had once been inhabited by giants. Cortez saw the same thing, and he thought, we got to send this to the king in Spain right away. There's a museum that has an Inca king's head, mummified, nine and a half feet tall, Inca king. Now, there's arrows on the side as a person standing beside the glass. The, to, that's a shadow of a person. Whoever took this picture was not supposed to be taking pictures in this place, but took the picture. Um, 
And so it's hard to really see scale of how big this thing, this, this head really is without the headdress. But now, oh, let me get, where are my notes at? Help, help a brother out here. Okay. Lenny Lenape, there's a, there's a people called the Lenny Lenape tribe. Lenny Lenape tribe, excuse, excuse me. And they talk about these people they were fighting. Said Men, many wonderful things are told of this famous people. They're said to have been remarkably tall and stout, and there's a tradition that there were giants among them, people of much larger size than the tallest in the tribe. Lenny and Lenape Indians moved from west to the Mississippi. They are an Iroquois-speaking tribe of Indians. They are moving from the west to the other side of the Mississippi. They sent scouts out. This is a writer of the time talking about how they, they, uh, their spies or their scouts returned safe from the eastern side of the Mississippi. They called it the River of Fish. They told them they found a further bank of the ridge of the fi- River of Fish inhabited by a very powerful people who dwelt in great villages surrounded by hall wa- ha- high walls. They were very tall, so tall that the head of the tallest tribesmen could not reach their arms. And their women, it says were of higher stature and heavier limbs than the loftiest and largest man in the Confederate nations. And you know we Americans can cook, so they were called the Alegui people. They were men delighting in red and black paint and shrill war whoops and the strife of the spear. Such was the relation made by the spies to their countrymen. Now, elders of this tribe still tell today of this horrible war war between the giants and their people. So what had happened, when their scouts went over, they saw that the land was already occupied by this giant race of people. They went to them, they asked them, can we settle in this land too? They were told no. Well, we're looking for something further this way. They gave them safe passage. The Legui people gave them safe passage through. Apparently what happened, when when the Legui saw how vast and numerous this Indian tribe was, they kind of freaked out. So they attacked them on the spot. And that started a war that lasted generations. They still talk about it. Um, Next, we have uh, Mr. David here. He is part of the uh, Tuscarora tribe. He writes in 1825 that among the legends of the people of the ancient stock, there was a powerful tribe. This is Ranawakata. Ranawakata. Yep, thank you. Mm, That's like eating something and choking, Ranawakata. So, yeah, I've had to phonetically spell these out because looking at them, I'm like, hmm. Ron Weasley, a Tanawanana, Manakika. No, Ranawakata, <laughs> powerful tribe called the Ranawakata. They were giants. They had a considerable, considerable habitation. After a time and having endured the outrages of these giants, it said that the people banded together and through the final force of about 800 warriors, they successfully annihilated them. They killed them. This doesn't stop just with these tribes, these Iroquois tribes. Same stories in, 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 in Arizona and Nevada in different areas of the country where they basically had to go to war. Now, he's writing on this. He says, after that, it was said that there were giants. There were no giants anywhere. It's supposed to have happened 2,500 winters before Columbus discovered America. 2,500 years before 1492. About 1,000 a, about a B.C. is when they're saying this has happened. Their history goes back to being there of, of that travel to, that he talks of at least 2,600 years in his book that he knows of. There's a prehistoric cemetery next two miles uh, on the bluffs near this junction of the Hart and the Missouri Rivers. There's a no- local cemetery. This is a local newspaper in 1883 talking about a prehistoric cemetery. As it, it goes on, it's called the Pioneer Cemetery. It's an old cemetery, fully 100 acres in extent, filled with the bones of a giant race. American newspaper, 1883. Vast city of dead lies just east of Fort Lincoln Road has the appearance of being filled with trenches piled full of dead bodies, both man and beast, and covered with several feet of earth. goes on to say this has evidently been a grand battlefield where thousands of men have fallen. And to say, 
nothing like a decent scientific exploration of this place has ever been done. Nobody's been, other than digging little holes here and there, that's it. But they've already dug up remains. Talking about the remains of giants being found in these feeble efforts of excavation. Five miles north on the opposite side of the Missouri River is another vast cemetery that's still been unexplored. We asked an aged Indian, it said, I didn't write this, it's in that paper, just saying. Uh, what he knew of these ancient graveyards, his answer is, me know nothing about them. They were here before the red man. Now, that, that's, I, I don't even like saying that. I feel, I feel I, I don't know, just, I feel, I feel like I'm ebonically talking for an Indian, but I don't know nothing about them. They were here before my people were. And that seems to be the story everywhere with Native Americans. There's a township open in 1872, one of the numerous Indian mounds that's in that neighborhood. Uh, it was locally known as the Bates Mound. They dug into it. They found broken earthenware, a lot of flint heads, and two stone implements. It's in Ohio. They go on. They found the remains of three, uh, three skeletons whose size would indicate they measured a life at least eight feet tall. They had double teeth in front as well as back of the mouth in both upper and lower jaws. Upon exposure to the atmosphere, they crumbled back to Mother Earth. So as soon as they were brought out of the earth, they crumbled into nothing. This is old stuff. It goes on. Cultivating the soil in the vicinity, implements have been found. Excavating the ground graves for graves, it's said that bones have been exhumed which seem to have belonged to a race of giants. Next one. It says that at one time digging, he came upon a skull, the size of the skull would cover his head and the jaw would be easily slipped over his face as though the head of the giant were enveloping his head. Quickly, this is an 18-kilogram axe head. That's 39 pounds. Ain't happening. Mm -mm. I ain't cutting nothing. <clears throat> Swing that for a day. 39, that's a 40-pound axe head, okay, found. They say it must have been um, decoration because they had a lot of material to waste back then. This is in uh, Manitoba. This is a, actually a, uh, a Native American axe head that made out of flintstone. It's hard to see in this picture, a 27-pound axe head. See, give me the next one of it. Kind of get a better picture of the side of it where the where the the wood shaft wide and wrapped around it. Twenty-seven pounds. The next one is a is a stone implement. This is a tool that's used and it's to be held between the thumb, the forefinger, and the middle finger as you strike at the thing you're making or creating. You see how large it is, right? Okay. I don't know. My dad's got big hands, but they ain't, they ain't like that. Uh, Next, I had to write this up to, to, to kind of get it in there, but this was an anthropologist, Discovery Made in India in 2006. Giant footprints found in the area believed to belong to Homo sapiens, humans that lived in the area 30,000 years ago. The footprints were two foot six inches long, 30 inches long. 30 inches long, they belonged to a giant human weighing about 882 pounds, having a height of about 17 feet. This is an anthropologist study saying this. There are footprints in rock, both small and big. All these footprints are in the shape of human feet, but bigger in size. They're similar to those found in Australia and found in Texas. I'd like to know where in Texas. I'm going to research that. Which are believed to be of a giant, this is Australian and Texas, eight to nine feet tall, about 780 pounds. It goes on to say the site is believed to have many items of geological and anthropological importance. It's never been studied again. After this write-up and they study, they closed it down. Here's a picture of uh, one found in the cave in Nevada, 1911. That's the skull. That's a ruler beside it. <clears throat> I know you probably can't really tell that, but just go put a ruler by your head later. And uh, uh, one of the let me give you the thumb bone. Now your thumb has three bones in it too. That you know you got the little tip, the one you always smash and stuff. Okay. Then you have this one that could be double-jointed and weird like mine, and the, down here, okay? We're going to look at the middle piece, this little one right here, that, that's about yay big on me, okay? And I have large hands. I just do. Or like a size 15 ring, 14, 15. That skull, this is the middle thumb bone. Next one. 
that belonged to the skull that Mr. Ron Wyatt dug up. That's a human next to him. There he is measuring it three and a half inches or so. Uh, that's how your whole thumb. There's some pieces put together there to show. I'm almost done. I know we're... Next one is a thigh bone. Remember those thigh bones that were found that were so big? This was found in Turkey. That is... Um, uh, I just lost the man's name. I studied a lot of his stuff. Um, I'll get it to you. If you've ever watched on social media the guy that does the debates with people and he talks about space, time, and matter, this is him. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's a thigh bone of a man. The next picture is a drawing. They wanted them to do a draw-up of how big this man would have been. So they had, a, had someone draw it up. Uh, this, one, this one in Egypt, not in Turkey, a different one. 47-inch human femur, 40, 47 inches. It is humorous. Ha, 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 yes. Oh, ding. Okay. Uh, they say that man was about 16 feet tall. The Bible tells the giants before and after the flood, Goliath was 9 feet. His king, King Og, was 12 feet, 18, or was uh, 12 to 18 feet. Giants have been found in Texas, Arizona, Ohio, Europe, and the Bible lands. There is a mummified, I don't have a picture of it today, but a mummified thumb or four finger, index finger of an Egyptian pharaoh. The finger is 11 inches long. It's a mummified index finger of a pharaoh in Egypt that's 11 inches long. Can you imagine that? Listen here, y'all. That, that would be great. You could really, I mean, you could get somebody's attention with that. You, you would slap somebody with your finger. But, like, no, yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> Need the light turn on? Watch. Bloop. <laughs> anyway, all right. Here's a full drawing of, of one of these bones found of what the size of the person would be next to a, to a full-grown man. Yeah. Yeah. Tonight's main event. I would not be fighting. I'm just going to tell you now I'd fall. Um, these are non-petrified, large non-petrified human jaw bones. Now, I know that you can't tell, but that gold thing in the corner is a bracelet, a round bracelet to slip over your hand onto your wrist. So something about yay big around, about the size of a watch band or so. If you think about that in relation to your jaw versus this thing, um, now you have, uh, this was in um, a 1904 newspaper in Wisconsin. Race of giants lived here, skeletons of mammoth human race unearthed in the county, found in a big mound. Wisconsin mounds were found containing hundreds of skeletons. One skull found was about three times the size of an ordinary man, and the other bones were correspondingly big. Genesis 6-4 tells us that there were giants in the earth in those days. Either it is what it is, and what it says is true, or it's not. And God said, let us make, in Genesis 1, 26, 27, man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created he, him, male and female, he created them. Next, what's this boy? Look at this boy. How will his worldview be? How is it going to change after 12 or 16 years in our school system right now? Absolutely. And beyond evolution, let me explain something. Beyond evolution theory, they are teaching them to be cubicle students, cubicle kids. They are training kids for cubicle. I understand. I get it. I do. Um, for me, there, there are things that, that the stresses of public school that, that my son will learn that I can't teach him, things I had to learn. And I get that. But they still, it still is our school system. And either we pull all our kids out and teach them ourselves, or we, put, we, we just actually, what we'll do is pawn them off on Rachel. Okay, we pull our kids off, we pawn them off on Rachel, and then when she gets mad, we go back to the public school system, we yell at them. No, we, we need to do something. We need some change. We need to be teaching this in our homes. I cannot parent your kids. I can pastor them. But you need to pastor and parent them at home. You need to be teaching them not to believe everything they hear, that, that yes, man may lie. You can trust mom, you can trust dad, but hey, listen. And I know that's a tough thing to teach a kid. 
I fought two years ago so much with my son. He was so indoctrinated about a mask that he would not go in a store with me without putting it on. I have to, Dad. I'm supposed to. I have to. It's rule. I have to. It's a, what, if I, what if I beat you if you put it on? I mean, I'm really at that point. Like, I, I think I'll just beat you, son. And he laughs at me because he knows I'm not going to. But, but he really, he would rather do that. He was that indoctrinated by it. What's their world view going to be? I mean, if we don't start teaching the Bible in our homes, 75% of children raised in Christian homes who attend public schools will reject the Christian faith by their first year in college. 75%. So to summarize all this, what I'm trying to say, God made the world. He owns it. He makes the rules like the Ten Commandments. That's how it is. We're guilty of breaking his rules. It's very simple. What rules? Well, let's look at the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not bear false witness. Go back to my summary. We're guilty of breaking his rules, and we will be punished, or we have to find a substitute to take our place. Jesus is that substitute. He is willing. This is a phenomenal thing to teach your kids at home. That vicarious atonement, that, that, that undeserved, unmerited grace and favor. Or you could do it this way. Which section do you want? Would you, you want smoking or non-smoking? If you were to die today. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. You're, you're too young. You're in restaurants. There used to be a... Do you? That didn't help your case, honey. That did not help your case. Uh, all right, so, and here's why I say that. Next slide. You're going to be dead a very long time. You are going to be dead a very long time. Long time. So right now, you have this. You have this much time right now before that. Give me my next slide. You have a dash. No, sorry. Um, but Sarah, you do have a dash. Um, that's okay. See, well, I'm 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 phonetically challenged and uh, and 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 vocabulary to challenge. So anyway, that's what we have. That's what we have with our kids. We actually don't even have that with our kids if you think about it. You, you have to start to learn to influence your kids and grandkids. And I need you to hear me out on this. You have to learn how to be an influencer to your children and your grandchildren or whoever you have under you. And I'll explain what I mean by that. You have, when your child is an infant, you have all authority over them. When they eat, where they sleep, whether they get changed or not, all authority is in your hands. Eventually, they get to where they can change themselves. They can feed themselves. And guess what? You had all authority here. Well, you just lost that authority because they can do that themselves. Well, if you try to keep that authority, eventually, what, Mom, I can do it myself. Right? So when you lose that authority, your influence has to increase. And eventually, they can start driving themselves. So your influence has to increase. Eventually, they can make some really stupid decisions like to date. Influence has to increase. <laughs> No, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, so ultimately you have no authority over their life towards the end, but you better have influence. What I see the Christian people and, and all people, but especially Christian people struggling with, you got a 19 to 39 year old kid that you're trying to have full authority over. You expect them to do it because you say, co, cause, say so because you're mom or dad. And they may because they're good old country kids, right? But this isn't going to help them. It's the influence that will help them. You've got to influence. You've got to be able to influence them without authority because of who you are. Now, beat the snot out of them when they're little. Don't get me wrong. Um, but right now, influence them, teach them, train them. They need to know they are not learning in school the difference between what a republic is and what a democracy is. We are not a democracy. We are, dem we are a democratic republic. A democracy, majority rules. They think we are a democracy. You ask any kid today, most of them will tell you we're a democracy. Most people think we're a democracy. Democracy means if I like Michael's jacket, 
and we all vote today, even though Mike bought that jacket and the majority says, I can have it, guess what? I get that jacket. That's democracy. A Democratic Republic says, Michael bought that jacket. You have no right to it. He worked. He earned money. He bought that himself. You have no right. That can't even go to vote. We are a Democratic Republic. They need to know the difference between the two because one has a really, really thin line between that and socialism. They need to know what Marxism is, socialism, communism. They need to know the terrors of it. They need to know truth that more people have been slaughtered in the name of atheistic nations than Christians ever. Yes, we've done horrible things in the name of Christ or in the name of church, excuse me. But if you compare the numbers, there's no comparison. They need to know that people are lying to them. And yeah, people that write textbooks may have an agenda. And people that, that make laws probably have an agenda. But if you'll go to the Word of God and you'll go to prayer and you'll go to spiritual leaders, then you can get guidance and wisdom in how you act. Right? We have lost this. We've got to get it back. We have got to gain this back where people actually go to the Word of God and they go to prayer and they go to spiritual leaders, get advice, get wisdom, and move from there instead of going to Fox News, CNN, YouTube, whatever. Because the person on the other side of that screen doesn't know you, does not care about you. And if you fail because you follow their advice, it doesn't hurt them, harm them one bit. So, what you going to do with your dash? Amen? All right, let's pray. I got a trip to make. Father God, help us to learn to have influence. To have influence not only with kids, grandkids, and family, but those around us, Lord. Help us to influence them by the way we act, the way we talk, Lord. Um, to, to just show people a different way. It doesn't even have to be on this right now, but, but God, that there is something different, there is something more, and there's a truth that they can hold on to that will not let them down. It will not change, it will not transform, and it will not neglect them or abandon them ever. It's the truth of the word of God. It is the gospel of grace. It is, it, is, it is the truth of salvation, the hope of salvation, the proof of salvation. Let us be that in Jesus' name, amen.